Welcome to Crosscut Now, the show that takes you beyond the breaking news, goes deeper into the issues you care about, and brings awareness to stories affecting communities. In today's episode, Seattle's own historian Knut Berger talks Mossback's Northwest's new season. Plus, we'll look at a noteworthy union win for some Starbucks baristas in eastern Washington. And more therapeutic courts are now in a major Washington city. I'm Paris Jackson. In today's episode, history and culture come together for a fascinating new season of one of our most popular shows. We'll get a sneak peek with the show's host ahead of the latest series debut. He's back. Knute Berger will soon share with us more history, culture, and oddities for a new season of Mossbacks Northwest. Season 8 airs on October 5th on KCTS 9. The surprises and through lines about the region's history are what viewers have come to love about Mossbacks Northwest. This new season will explore bold themes and people like visionary women, fearsome bears, and an Italian garden that bore, as Canute calls it, civic fruit. Many lessons are learned throughout the episodes, even for the Mossback editorial team, that history is everywhere. Knut says they're very selective on stories and finding good stories isn't rare. The editorial team also learned for season eight the importance of digitizing historic archives to increase access to documents, artifacts, and original source materials. You'll soon be able to watch eight new fall Mossback episodes as well as listen to the companion Mossback podcast. And coming up in December, watch for a half hour anthology special of Mossback's Northwest. We sit down with Knut Berger inside the Mossback Den for interesting nuggets for what's to come in season eight. Welcome, Knut Berger. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to you, Paris. You're in the Mossback Den. That's uh, very exciting. Excited to be in here. Now, you have Mossback's Northwest season eight debuting October the 5th, eight episodes. And one thing about what you do in each and every season is you're shining the light on those stories we may have forgotten or you're telling us stuff that we don't even know about. What keeps you excited and just curious about storytelling? Well, I love Northwest history. I grew up here. It's just been part of my life since the very beginning. And uh, there's so many stories that are relevant to today. In other words, that you can find some aspect that sheds light on where we are now. And so that's a real interest of mine. And I look for stories that I think are kind of I describe it as undertold. Not you may have heard the story before, but we will find aspects that you haven't. We were having a conversation, and you were sharing with me some of the the main highlights of what viewers can expect from uh, season eight. And you mentioned cataclysm, heroism, and racism. Explain a little bit more about that. Well, I think the season just covers a huge gamut. It goes around the world. It <laughs> looks at some disastrous things that happened in our past. And it also looks at, at acts of uh, heroism. And I, I just think it reflects the kind of rich variety of the history of the Northwest. We kind of have a little bit of everything. One thing that you continue to highlight is Seattle is the city of so many firsts. And coming up, we're going to learn about that first flight around the world. Tell me a little bit more about what we can expect with that episode. Well, this is something that, unless you're a real aviation buff, you probably don't know that the first successful around the world flight took off and landed in Seattle in the 1920s. So we're headed up to the 100th anniversary of this event. And at the time, it was huge. It was like the original astronauts going into space. Yeah. There were eight men were selected and they took four planes and they hopped around the globe and some of them made it back. Can you have an episode that's dedicated to pea patches? And in that, we're learning about a connection to a Seattle farm. Kind of give us a little bit of a nugget. Don't give too much away, but tell us a little bit about that. If pea patches come from somewhere, the idea, they're in every neighborhood now. But the original pea patch is a really interesting story, and it stems from an Italian immigrant family that moved to Seattle in the late 19th century, and they farmed in what's now the city. Hmm. And the farm lasted into the early 1960s. Now, this is the era of Century 21 and uh, post-war sprawl, and somebody came up with the idea of preserving a piece of that farm to to uh, be a, a pilot test 
for pea patches. And it's grown into quite a thing. And so we tell the story of how that happened. For people that may not be familiar with Moss Backs Northwest, why should they watch? I think people who are interested in Northwest history will be really interested in these shows. I think people who aren't particularly interested will find good stories that appeal to a broad cross-section of people and cover a lot about who we are, where we came from, what we have struggled with, and I think they'll find that these episodes collectively have relevance to how we're living now. Knut, it was a pleasure speaking with you. If you want to learn more about season eight of Mossback on KCTS, it's coming up on October the 5th. A group of Eastern Washington baristas joins the ranks of other unionized Starbucks workers. More on what it means for them. More yes votes led to a notable win to unionize for Eastern Washington Starbucks workers, a rare occurrence since organizing started at the Coffee Giants franchises about two years ago. The recent majority vote happened in mid-September by Benton County Starbucks baristas to join the National Workers United Union, making the Prosser location the 27th franchise in Washington to vote to join the union and just the third in Eastern Washington. While unionization moved more slowly at the region's Starbucks cafes, baristas say it's because there are fewer stores, less visible Workers United reps, and job loss fears. Starbucks in an email said while Starbucks prefers a direct relationship with its partners, we respect the outcome of all fairly conducted elections and continue to make an effort to meet those unions at the bargaining table to progress good faith contract negotiations. However, none of the roughly 9,500 company-owned Starbucks shops nationwide have secured an initial contract. Washington's trend of treatment courts expanded to the state's third largest city. We'll explore how it aims to curb recidivism. This summer, the city of Tacoma launched what are called therapeutic courts, an alternative system of justice that other Washington municipalities have participated in for nearly three decades. The mental health court aims to treat and rehabilitate people accused of crimes who are also dealing with mental illness diagnosis. Washington has experimented with treatment courts where instead of jail time, those accused are offered help to address the root causes of why they're in the system in the first place in hopes of reducing their chances of reoffending. A 2021 report on King County Community Court found that by the third year after enrolling in community court, participants saw 87% fewer jail bookings compared to the year before they enrolled. But there are critics. This year, the city of Seattle terminated its community court model, citing low court completion rates and a lack of screening for individuals with serious criminal histories as evidence of the court's ineffectiveness. I'm Paris Jackson. Thank you for watching Crosscut Now, your destination for nonprofit Northwest news. Go to crosscut.com for more.